Hello everyone! Today's video discussion delves into a cornerstone of the Christian faith. Delving into the scriptures, let's kick off with a biblical passage featuring the prophet Elijah who awaited rain atop Mount Carmel. He dispatched his servant to scan the horizon towards the sea, and only on the seventh try did a small cloud appear. This narrative subtly underscores the intricate nature of God's workings and the imperative for unwavering patience and faith. The crux lies in two key elements. Firstly, the deliberate and often subtle maneuvers of the divine, a theme recurrent throughout Scripture. The book of Psalms, for instance, is replete with instances where the psalmist beseeches God, grappling with his perceived delays and apparent aloofness to human plight. Yet this dynamic isn't confined to ancient texts. It resonates in our contemporary spiritual journey. Even in our minor trials, we often find ourselves questioning why God seems reticent, why His responses evade us, and why His methods remain shrouded in mystery. This sense of divine latency is a common thread, binding both novice seekers and seasoned devotees alike. In essence, newcomers might initially be oblivious to this, but it's a shared struggle among spiritual stalwarts. Over centuries, even the most venerable servants of God have wrestled with the notion of divine timing, grappling with the apparent tardiness of God's interventions. Sometimes it seems to God's people that the Lord is not in a hurry to respond, sometimes even seemingly late, especially when the need is dire. The importance of faith. In this brief message, we'll focus on the second aspect of this issue, the necessity of persistence and patience in faith. It would be fair to say that the most critical moment at Mount Carmel occurred when the prophets of Baal exhausted themselves in their futile prayers and were forced to yield to Elijah with his water-soaked altar and simple yet earnest appeal to the God of Israel. Truly this was the most thrilling moment in the culmination of the entire story when fire fell from heaven. But let's imagine if that had been the end of the story. Let's remember that at that time, the land was suffering from a severe three-year drought, and what was needed to sustain life was not fire, but water. People needed rain, a lot of rain. As awe-inspiring as the consumption of the sacrifice by fire was, there would have been no hope for the people if rain had not come. The Lord undoubtedly knew how critical the situation was for the people. Perhaps everyone expected him to act immediately, for the people had rejected Baal and turned back to God. When the people fell on their faces and cried out, The Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God, it seemed to be the ultimate proof of universal repentance. As a natural continuation of this story, rain clouds should have gathered and a downpour should have drenched the thirsty land. Nevertheless, no rain came. Elijah, however, was confident in his heart and without hesitation told Ahab that rain was coming soon. He did not relax, but went up to the top of Carmel, bowed down to the ground, put his face between his knees, and began to pray earnestly. James, referencing this passage in his epistle, says he prayed fervently, or prayed earnestly, implying that it was not a simple prayer. Much more was required in this situation. The prophet needed focus and concentration. Nevertheless, there were no signs of rain. It seemed that during such a crisis, God was delaying. How else can we explain the apparent lack of response from God? I believe it is closely tied to the unknown servant boy, who in this situation provides us all with a good example of service. The scriptures do not mention his name. We don't know where he came from. Up to this point in the narrative, nothing has been said about him, and it seems that all this time Elijah was alone. After this event, Elijah left the boy in Beersheba, and subsequently, Elisha served as the prophet's assistant. This unknown boy only appears in this episode, and then disappears from the scene, teaching us an important principle of serving God, which is persistence. The battle had already ended. It seemed a great victory had been won, yet the rain still did not come. This serves as a crucial warning against any form of self-satisfaction. Even after we have invested ourselves fully in a task and ensured success, we cannot be content and rest on our laurels. The principle described here, or the spirit of service, requires persistence in faith. You won't find a single servant of God, highly esteemed in Scripture, who did not cultivate persistence in faith. 
We see this in the example of this servant boy, and strangely enough, the same trial was faced by Elijah's successor, Elisha, whose true labor began on the day he was inspired by his master. It happened when Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. 2 Kings 2, 2. Elijah repeatedly made the same offer to Elisha, Stay here, stay here. But Elisha refused, and his response was always the same. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Eventually it all came to one climactic moment when Elijah promised Elisha, If you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. As a result of such persistence, Elisha received a double portion of the Spirit for his ministry. Now, let's return to Carmel. Undoubtedly, Elijah's faith elicited a remarkable response from God. Fire fell upon the altar. One might think that Elijah could rightfully allow himself to do nothing more. He could have comfortably committed everything into the hands of the Lord. He could have sat back, folded his hands, and watched as God finished the rest. If you were in Elijah's shoes and had achieved such a great victory with the internal assurance that the outcome was already determined, wouldn't you be tempted to simply sit back and peacefully watch everything unfold. However, Elijah acted quite differently. He ascended high up the mountain. He drew near to the Lord. And Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Elijah went to pray. He knew that his work was not yet finished. He was determined to see it through to the end. Now let's shift our focus to the servant boy. He also needed to climb the mountain because he had something else to do before the rain came. He was instructed to look toward the sea, the direction from which the cloud was expected to appear. He looked and saw nothing. So he came and reported to his master, There is nothing. Could it be possible that even after all the spiritual warfare, after all the prayers, after all the seeking of God, and after the confirmation God provided by sending fire, the heavens remained closed? There is nothing. Many of us have experienced or are currently experiencing such moments. It seems like an incredibly painful outcome. It's the moment of great trial for our faith. We fought for so long, we've expected so much, only to ultimately be faced with disappointment and to admit that we simply have no evidence that God is acting or doing anything. What should we do in such situations? There are two possible ways forward. Firstly, we could acknowledge that it was all just an illusion, and due to the seeming silence of God, we could allow despair to paralyze us. Alternatively, the alternative approach would be to continue to act and pray, even if it takes seven times. The first time, the servant boy saw nothing. He had to go again. He saw nothing again. He went a third time and returned with the same words, There is nothing. He had to go a fourth time, but still, there was no hint of an answer. I try to imagine the tone in which he reported the results to his master when he returned the fifth and sixth times. I imagine how he could have commented on it. What's the point? It would have been quite natural if he had become frustrated and said, I see no point in going there again. I'm tired of coming back with the words, There is nothing. Nevertheless, he went to the sea for the seventh time. Once again... This time he saw a small cloud. It was so small that against the vast sky it seemed the size of a human palm. It's amazing how God goes to such lengths in matters of persistency in our faith. Whether there was any significance to the number seven or not is not so important. What matters is that resolving this situation required perseverance and persistence of faith until the breakthrough occurred. The small cloud was just a pledge of what was to come, but it was enough for Elijah to immediately warn Ahab to prepare for departure. Faith is the essence of the unseen. She takes a pledge for the whole. In this case, it was exactly so, because soon many clouds appeared in the sky. I think that's the simplicity of this message. It doesn't require much effort to start something big, accompanying it with noise, vigorous activity, and great expectations of something great that, in our opinion, God will do and then give up and abandon everything because of disappointments and unfulfilled hopes. Our prayers tend to fade. Our strength and enthusiasm wane only because it seems to us that God is not responding. But what does God do? He educates His servant. For Him, 
this process is much more important than the service itself that he will subsequently bear. Such a servant must understand that the Lord cares about the reputation of his name much more than we do. God himself knows better how to defend his name. The Lord is God. The Lord needed to clearly show this a second time, not only in fire but also in water, by sending rain to the earth, not only in judgment but also in mercy, not only in death but also in the resurrection life. His slowness, His hiddenness, His seeming indifference, all of these are tools of testing through which God nurtures true faith in His servants and through which He imparts to us the essence of His Spirit. It was not difficult for God to send rain. But for Him, the more significant and more challenging task was to compel His servant to continue looking, waiting and praying seven times, and yet not doubting, despairing, or giving up. After all, there was no lack of water. But this rain came as a result of the second struggle. First, there was a struggle with Baal, and then there was a struggle with unbelief, the battle outside and the battle within. The entire outcome depends on the latter, internal battle. Complete victory comes as a result of the persistence and steadfastness of our faith. The Bible calls faith the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews 11, 1. Some think that faith is simply a way of saying that they believe in something. Others consider faith to represent the religions of the world. Jesus himself spoke about faith many times. Once he proclaimed, Have faith in God, Mark 11, 22, teaching us that we should be possessors of faith, and only one faith is worthy of that. In another passage, Jesus said, O you of little faith, Matthew 8:26 implying that faith is measurable and that the disciples lacked what they needed. They still had room to grow. He even told a parable about faith and its powerful effect. He compared it to a tiny mustard seed, which has potentially immense growth and the ability to be a shelter for others, Matthew 13, 31, 34. But in this case, in Luke 8, 25, Jesus asks, Where is your faith? He wasn't just reproaching the disciples for their lack of faith. The question where wasn't an accusation of lacking faith. On the contrary, it was an explanation of how they misplaced their faith. The word where in this passage is a directing word. It means they placed their faith where it didn't belong. It's about location. And don't we do the same? We say we trust God. But when the storm comes, we find that we've entrusted ourselves to other people, places, or things. When those things are shaken greatly, we lack faith. Faith only works when it's placed in the one who is always faithful. Storms will arise suddenly and without warning, and the winds and waves will mercilessly beat against us. Yet we have a constant hope from knowing the fact that Jesus is in our boat with us. So, have faith in God. He has given us His Word, and we are heading to the other side. The doctrine of God in the Creed begins with the word, I believe. God is the first object of Christian faith. Thus, our Christian profession of the existence of God is based not on rational grounds, not on proofs taken from reason or derived from the experience of our external senses, but on an internal, higher conviction having a moral basis. To believe in God means, in Christian understanding, not only to intellectually acknowledge God, but also to seek Him with the heart. We believe in that which is inaccessible to external experience, scientific investigation, or perception by our organs of external senses. Christian faith is a mysterious phenomenon in the realm of the human soul. It is broader than thought, stronger, more effective. It is more complex than individual feelings. It contains feelings of love, fear, reverence, or humility. Faith also cannot be called a volitional phenomenon, because although it moves mountains, the Christian, by believing, renounces their own will, wholly surrendering themselves to the will of God. The source of faith is revelation. By the word revelation, in a narrow sense, is meant the manifestation of hidden mysteries or supernatural communication of any new and unknown truths from God to humans. In contrast to supernatural revelation, the continuous manifestation of the actions of the all-good providence of God manifested through natural forces and laws of nature established by the Creator, 
is called natural revelation. This latter type of revelation is referred to in Holy Scripture by a more general term, manifestation, as opposed to the more specific word, revelation, which predominantly signifies the revelation of any mystery or truth beyond the power of the natural human mind. In conclusion, the story of the prophet Elijah and his faithful servant on Mount Carmel teaches us important lessons about faith, perseverance, and dedication to God. Our faithfulness to God and our belief in Him should not depend on external circumstances or temporary trials. Even when we face difficulties and storms in life, our confidence should be rooted in Him, who is always faithful to His promises. Persistence in prayer and faith is the key to developing our spiritual life and communion with God. We must continue to pray and expect God's answer, even if it seems unsuccessful or unfair. Every trial of faith, every struggle we experience, is an opportunity for us to strengthen our faith and to know God more deeply. God uses these moments to strengthen us and teach us to trust Him more deeply. And finally, our faith should be based on God's revelation through His Word and His actions in the world. We should seek to understand and comprehend God's will so that our faith may be strong and steadfast. Thus, the story of Elijah reminds us that our faith should not weaken in the face of trials, but should become a source of strength and confidence in God. Subscribe to our channel for more inspiring content and meaningful discussions. Don't miss out on the latest updates and valuable insights. Join our community today by hitting the subscribe button and turning on notifications. Thank you for your support.